Happy to be joined by Dan Canovio of Inside Boxing Live, part of John Boy Media. You can check that out on YouTube. And I just want to qualify this for a second. So for boxing, I watch like five to ten fights a year. Like I'm, I'm as casual a boxing guy as it gets. What's your, I guess, level of enjoyment or level of consumption rather for MMA? Like I, I just want, I want to get a boxing guy on the show today. And I think you're uh, my guy. Um, I did buy the Aljamain Sterling, uh, Sean O'Malley. Uh, pay-per-view because uh, I grew up in the same area as Aljamain Sterling and I was hanging out with him uh, about a month before that fight so I ordered that fight I that's the last I that was probably one of the very few pay-per-views I ever really ordered and sat down and watched because I was curious about the fight I was also curious about like the the presentation of it um, and I want to see how it differed from a boxing pay-per-view and I was really uh, impressed by it but I would say the big ones I would say I'm a very casual MMA fan. I think I ordered Connor versus Habib. I know that was like three or four, five years ago. Um, but it's very, very, very few and far between because I just watch so much boxing and obviously they go up against each other. So I really, uh, it's few and far between. But the big ones, I could be sucked in and uh, like uh, Sterling versus uh, uh, O'Malley. That's one I, I made sure to watch. So what you said is like me with boxing. Like, you know, I can watch like my, my Tank Garcia's my Spence Crawfords, and, uh, you know, that's about where it ends. And, of course, I watched Fury versus Ngannou. If there's anything kind of MMA-adjacent, I'll watch that. The influencer boxing is, like, not my thing. I know a lot of people love it, but I, I, can't, I can't really watch it that seriously. But Fury and Ngannou, I'm coming at this from a bit of a different perspective. I was actually calling an MMA event while that fight was going on. Of course, they, you know, they say they're going to make the walk to the ring at 5.40 p.m. Eastern. It ends up being 6.40 p.m. Eastern. The prelims for the card that I'm doing play-by-play -play from start at 6.30. I thought right. it was going to start at like 3 o'clock when I saw what the time change was in Saudi Arabia to begin with. So I was really hoping to be able to watch it live. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to, but I was able to kind of follow along on social media. And my first reaction when I saw the response was, ah, these MMA guys are probably overreacting. There's, you know, I want to hear from people that know the boxing judging criteria. I want to hear from the box, you know, people inside, in the know in boxing. And then I started to hear from guys like Adam Catterall. You know, Brian Campbell was kind of more on, on the Fury side, but Catterall and Nick Pete were very much in the, in the camp that Francis won the fight. Uh, I saw a lot of different people in the boxing side say that Francis won. And that to me was like, okay. Now we're starting to see some buy-in from boxing, and I wasn't sure that would be there when I was seeing the commentary from kind of the MMA side. So I would just love to know what your takeaway was from the boxing match we saw on Saturday. I did think that Tyson Fury won. Um, if you go by how you score a fight, obviously it's a 10-9 must system. It's round by round, and there were rounds that Ngannou won. Clearly the third round when he knocked him down, that's a 10-8 round. There were other rounds where I think Ngannou edged it out. But to me, I thought that Tyson Fury won six of the ten rounds, and then you throw in the knockdown. That's what makes it a one a one point uh, fight. The fact that this fight was a one point fight is absolutely incredible. It's incredible for a number of reasons. How Tyson Fury did not look like himself, and it's obviously incredible because Francis Ngannou uh, outperformed all the expectations. And I think that was a big reason why some people were grading on a curve or scoring on a curve for Ngannou. This happens a lot in boxing. It happens a lot in MMA. When the guy that you were not expecting to do much kind of uh, exceeds his expectation and goes above and beyond, you start giving him the benefit of the doubt and you start giving him rounds that uh, he did not win. Not only that, the ninth and 10th round, I think Ngannou is going to kick himself for because he only landed six punches, uh, according to CompuBox. That's not going to win you uh, the final two rounds. He should have sold out a little more. It was clear that Fury was off of his game. He could have stepped on the gas pedal and Gano and erased all doubt and won that ninth and 10th round and probably could have won the fight going away. But if you take away all the emotions from it, you take away the variables, which is kind of hard to do. Uh, I think a lot of people go into these fights with preconceived notions. Uh, they don't like Tyson Fury or they really enjoy Ngannou and his story. So uh, he's a novice and wouldn't it be awesome if he went in there and, and took out the greatest heavyweight uh, of this generation. So if you just actually score the fight, uh, I, I think that Fury did just enough, barely enough uh, to win a split decision or uh, at least officially, but to win the fight 6-4 uh, on my card. All right, so let's go back to your other point about the preconceived notions because admittedly, whenever I see one of these fights come together, and they don't come together that often as much as we see the influencer stuff, when you talk about like a Mayweather versus McGregor type thing, you know, I was going to call my wife when I was in Vegas and I saw that the line for Mayweather was like minus 275 and, and I was going to say like, we should pull out like 100 grand and bet it on Mayweather. Like this is a slam dunk. 
That's uh, money. Isn't that uh, yeah, what they do? Like uh, uh, the, the, not saying you're a money launderer, but that's what the money launderers do. That they, they see a crazy uh, uh, favorite like Mayweather and they just dump a ton of money into it. I, I just, the line to me made no sense, right? Because you got to, these are two different sports. Yeah. Going into this fight, I said, you know what? It's heavyweight. And anything can happen at heavyweight. Somebody can land a big punch. We know that Francis, Francis and Gano has crazy power. But at the same time, we're talking about like the best heavyweight of what, the last 15 years? I guess that, is that fair to say? I would say so. I mean, there were, you talk to a different person in the boxing world to get a different answer, but he's pretty dominant. I mean, those wins over Wilder, the win uh, ending Klitschko's reign. I, I still think that Anthony Joshua has a better resume, but if you put Joshua in the ring versus Fury, you would favor him. I think you would favor Fury over just about every heavyweight, so therefore, I mean, he's probably the, the best of this crop. So when you take a guy, like you mentioned, complete novice, Owen as a boxer, has never really had even like an amateur boxing match. You know, I'm sure he's had some steam, you know, <laughs> some some cookers. Smokers. Is that what they call them? Smokers? Smokers. Smokers. Again, I'm, I'm from the, uh, the MMA world, so I'm, I'm trying to keep up with yeah. the lingo. Uh, but, you know, I just didn't think that he had even close to a chance here. I thought that the, his best case scenario, somebody said, what would it take to be considered a win for Francis Ngannou? And I said, either he gets a knockdown or it goes the distance. Both of those things happened. Uh -huh. But, I mean... I just thought that was the best case scenario, and that's seemingly is exactly what played out. Yeah, it's wild, man. I, I was watching the fight unfold, and uh, I had just been traveling back from Orlando. I was calling Amanda Serrano's fight. It was a pretty historic night there of uh, 12 rounds, uh, three minute rounds. And I was like, all right, I'll order the fight because uh, I, I always have to be in the mix, and I don't want to feel like I'm missing out. But I'm not really going to, like, you know, I didn't have a party or anything. I wasn't, like, sitting there with a notepad on the edge of my seat. I just kind of watched it while laying on the couch on a, on a you know lazy Saturday afternoon. And then the fight starts, and I'm like, all right, Fury just doesn't look like himself. And Ganu, like, first round, I was like, yo, this guy is moving, like, very well in there. Uh, he has educated movement. Like, he has good good defense, and he's very powerful, and he's moving Tyson Fury. Like, you know, he wasn't exactly landing anything in the first two rounds, but he was so physically big. Like, the thing with Fury is he's able to push around Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder is a very tall man, but he weighs in at about 215 uh, to 220 for for their three fights. So Fury was able to push him around and move him. He was not able to push Ngannou around. So the first two or three rounds, or first two rounds, I should say, I was like, okay, Ngannou's actually a lot better than I thought. And then the third round comes and he drops him. That's when all hell breaks loose. That's when I, you go into Twitter, you're texting your friends, you're saying, I can't not believe this. That's where the drama sets in. And that's when you're entering the, the unreal atmosphere. You're entering this, I can't believe this. This is like the part of the movie or the part of the script, and there should be a movie on Nganu's life, where you start to say, no, this this can't be real. This can't really be happening. And and that's what we had. And that's why the you know combat sports are so amazing, because you never know what could happen. That's why heavyweight boxing is so amazing, because literally one punch can change everything. I just can't believe that an 0-0 boxer could do what he did against Tyson Fury. I mean, even if Tyson Fury came off the couch that day and went to the gym and, and was kind of taking rounds off against somebody who had no experience, like, you just... It was almost unfathomable, uh, unfathomable to watch that unfold. I can barely even say unfathomable because of how unfathomable it was. But to watch that unfold on Saturday was just, I, I just don't know what to think coming out of that. And that's why I want to ask you, as a boxer, how would you rate Francis Ngannou? Like, if, you know, looking at it surely from a technical standpoint, is he a good boxer? I think from a technical standpoint, he is a good boxer. I think boxing was his first love and he grew up, you know, boxing and if not official fights, but... You know, I heard a story that Mike Tyson was his was his uh, inspiration, and he didn't even know what Mike Tyson looked like. He just knew of Mike Tyson. Uh, and then the next thing you know, Mike Tyson's training him for the biggest fight of his life. I, I just love Francis Ngannou's story. Um, but I think he's a good boxer. I, I think he's shown the skills in there. And with heavyweight boxing, and my colleague Chris Algieri, who I host Inside Boxing Live with, has said numerous times, is that heavyweight boxing is almost a different sport than the rest of boxing. I mean, they operate in a different class in terms of finances. They operate in a different class in terms of in the ring. There are certain things in heavyweight boxing that you can get away with deficiencies that you can't get away with in, in the lower weights. If you have the game-changing power that Deontay Wilder had for, for 10 years, I mean, he wasn't the greatest boxer, Deontay Wilder, but he had that equalizer. The same thing with Ngannou is you can get away with some deficiencies. You can get away with not having the best footwork because you have that game-changing power. You're able to land a shot on Fury that wasn't even a flush shot that got the top of his head, and he goes down. So I think Nganu can hang with some of the better heavyweights, but there are going to be different variables. There isn't going to be this element of surprise 
off Rangano anymore. I think there's going to be a game plan for him. I think there's going to be expectations for him. A lot changes if he does fight a Deontay Wilder or a uh, Anthony Joshua or a Big Bang Zhang. I mean, there's a lot going into it, but I, I'll tell you what, I, I want to see it. I, I want to see in Francis Gano box more. I came away, that's what the biggest thing I came away from was boxing just scooped up a superstar. We have added a new name to the to the heavyweight division. It's Francis Ngannou. This is a great thing for boxing. All I was seeing about, this is a black eye for boxing. This is the worst thing that's ever happened. Yeah, it's embarrassing. Tyson Fury is the guy that ultimately has to live with this, but we just gained Francis Ngannou. He's now part of the boxing world, or at least I think he will be after getting a taste of a $10 million purse. Well, that's a great perspective to look at it that way. But in terms of a lot of your contemporaries in boxing and people that cover the sport, that are more entrenched in like just the boxing side of things. I'm not talking about like a Brian Campbell who's kind of in both worlds. What was their reaction to this? Like, is this, was this kind of a uh, situation where the sky was falling or are people looking at it with the same well, kind of, you know, perspective as you are? Everyone wants to say the sky's falling in boxing. It's one of the easiest things to do uh, for like the, the lifers in boxing. I always want to talk about how this is a black guy. This is corrupt. This is a, they always look for a reason to crap on their own sport. And I'm not that way. And I haven't been that way since I got into this media game. I'm looking for the positives. I'm looking for how can we move this sport forward. How is Francis Ngannou being in boxing a bad thing? Like how is that adding another name to the boxing ranks, the heavyweight ranks that got this entire office talking about uh, boxing, and this office does not usually talk about boxing here at, at John Boy. I don't understand how that is a, a bad thing. And another thing on top of it is I think that uh, maybe the MMA world is not up to uh, up to date on what boxing fans think of Tyson Fury. I can't speak for all boxing fans, but I know that there's a large majority that are just grown tired of his entire act, whether it's the inactivity whether it's the empty negotiations with Anthony Joshua, uh, whether it's never fighting Usyk or delaying that, even, you know, that's a saga that's still playing out now. It's the front-facing videos he does constantly, the empty call-outs, the retirement, uh, flirtations. Everyone in the boxing world, or I would say the majority, can't say everyone because he does have fans, was growing tired of Tyson Fury's act. So to see him get knocked down in round three, to see him get humbled, I think there's a lot of people in the boxing world that are celebrating this on uh, Monday afternoon. I did think there was something of an overcorrection on the MMA side where people were saying, well, Ngannou is going to be able to beat Wilder now, beat Joshua now. It's like, well, let's pump the brakes just a little yeah, bit. Yeah, it's a little prisoner of the moment type of thing. I, I do think I want to see it. I'll tell you that much. And I think those fights are going to be made because if you take a look around the heavyweight division of boxing, no one is fighting each other. I mean, Wilder uh, it hasn't fought Joshua and they've been you know, champions at the same time or at least in the top five since 2017. Hell, Tyson Fury hasn't even fought Anthony Joshua and that's the biggest fight you could possibly make in, in the UK, but not anymore. That's why I think Saturday was like a culmination of a lot of things. I think it was karma and I think uh, it, it was uh, poetic justice in a way for Tyson Fury. And I also think it made the heavyweight division look like absolute fools because now a quote-unquote novice comes into the division and now he's stealing the spotlight. And I actually think in a way that, that Joshua and Wilder are going to chase Ngannou, not the other way around. That's how crazy this is and that's how sparse the big fights were in the heavyweight division. So they have no one to blame other than themselves, some of these heavyweights. So let's expand on that as well as the point that Chris Algieri made, which was that heavyweight boxing is kind of its own animal. If we take a Sean O'Malley and put him in there against like a Devin Haney or Javante Davis, know. he's got no chance, right? I mean, no is, is, but can we still say that after what we saw on Saturday? No, what we can say is those fights are going to happen. I thought that this fight on Saturday night poured gasoline on the boxer versus MMA fights. I thought they were done. I thought they were tired. And if you look at the lead up to this Ngano Fury fight, didn't have the same buzz as Mayweather McGregor at all. Um, but the fact that the MMA guy, the fact that a, a novice like Ngannou and the fact that it was against Fury, the heavyweight champion, this changes everything. Now I actually do think a Sean O'Malley versus Javante Davis could happen. Uh, Canelo versus anyone around that weight. But the thing is, is that it's different with heavyweights. Going back to my original point, heavyweights can get away with certain things that other the lower weights can't. I don't think Sean O'Malley has the footwork to stand in there and survive and, and actually win rounds against Devin Haney or Javante Davis. Uh, the same thing against Canelo, and I would say, who, Leon Edwards? They, they, uh, Leon Edwards is a great striker, but there's, a, there's the other things that you can't get away with is the, the, the footwork, uh, the stamina, um, the pa punching power, and all that. 
you can get away with that in heavyweight because, like we said before, like if your your legs cannot be there, your footwork it doesn't have to be. There. They don't really rely on footwork as much heavyweights as the as the lower weights. Where Ngannou can drop uh, Tyson Fury. I just don't think it can happen at the lower weights, but I don't think it's going to stop it from from them exploring those fights now. Well, Dana White's always talked about launching Zufa boxing. Now, if if I saw what happened on Saturday, this is what I would do with Zufa boxing. I would just make it a promotional company and bring over the UFC fighters that want to fight in boxing, the ones that have championships or whatever, and just co-promote and make money that way. I mean, I'll you, ask don't, you don't have to do much, I'll, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, he's been trying to find a way to make that work. And I think every time he's dabbled with joining, jumping into the boxing ranks, he's taking a look at the, the business side and be like, oh, I can't dominate like I do in the UFC. This is Dana White. I can't control the market. Why would I want to go work with Bob Arum or work with Eddie Hearn or work with PBC? I'll ask you uh, from an MMA side. Don't you think Dana White will want to be more in involved with, with these types of fights? Don't you think uh, that maybe with the, the new merger with TKO, do you think they have any interest in seeing what they just saw in Saudi Arabia? And we're like, hey, uh, Dana, um, wasn't Francis Ngannou on the, your roster just about a year and a half ago or two years ago? Wasn't he the UFC heavyweight champion? Why are we not part of these types of fights going forward? So I'm asking you, do you think that with this merger, there could be more ways for the UFC to get involved in cross-promotional boxing fights? Well, I think you have to look at it kind of two ways. You got to look at the, the plus and you got to look at the, the minus. So the, the, I think the positive of that is that if you have a guy that is able to do what Francis did on Saturday and actually make a really good account of himself, I think that'll elevate their star power in the UFC. So like you, you look at what you can do and use it as kind of a marketing vehicle. They, they make a little bit more money because it's, a, again, a boxing co-promotion. So they get paid boxing money and you, you kind of go into that sort of, uh, I guess, model for boxing. And then there's kind of the other side of that was like, well, if we open that door, what are we opening our, ourselves up to in the future? Are we just going to have champions that are going to hold out until they get a boxing match? How is it going to affect our business in terms of the UFC going forward? Because it's, a, it's an incredibly different structure of how mm -hmm. the UFC works compared to the boxing world. Very, very different. So that, that's the thing is like, would they be willing to disrupt their own model in order to perhaps make more money and, and use it as a marketing platform, a marketing vehicle for their athletes in the UFC? So they go, they box, whatever happens, happens, and then they're back in the UFC and more eyeballs have been on them. But, you know, the, the thing about it is like, do you think that any more people are going to watch MMA because of what they saw from Francis and Gannon, like boxing diehards? Are any of them going to be like, I should, I should probably check MMA out now because look at how no. well Francis, probably not, right? Well, so, I'll watch him. I think, I think if he does a PFL um, fight, I think there will be a few that are just curious because he's like, you know, the, a phenomenon now. But I do agree with a lot of you said. Uh, is this an aberration? Uh, Ngano Fury, uh, everything went right, and and Ngano takes down uh, or knocks down the heavyweight champ, and he gets like this moral victory. Then he returns to the UFC with, you know, his head held high and his value up more, or could it look like a Sean O'Malley going over to boxing and get brutally knocked out by Javante Davis inside of four rounds? And then he goes back to the UFC as damaged goods. So I, I, I'm curious to see how it all plays out. I think Dana, I said this on my show, any fighter that could make Dana White and Tyson Fury look simultaneously bad is a, is a hero in my eyes. And uh, Francis Ngannou was able to do that. But I do think that Dana White is is got a lot of uh, questions right now, and especially with his his new business partners about how can we get involved in these mega events. Yeah, and, and they did that with uh, McGregor Mayweather, but they weren't super involved. Like I don't think they have. It wasn't like UFC presents, if I recall, right? They're like, did they have their name as a co-promoter of the event? I can't, I can't even remember. Maybe was it McGregor? Did. Yeah. No, no. I know. I think that was like a straight up PBC or was it? I think it was even before PBC. It was 2017. It was PBC. It was like Mayweather Promotions and like. Uh, promotions. I mean, I mean, yeah. obviously Dana was there and he was part of the promotion and he was part of the, the post fight press conferences. I don't know what UFC was, how they were involved in terms of branding or signage, but I knew that they obviously got a big percentage. I'm curious to see now what happens with Francis Ngannou, and I know he's doing some interviews today, and that'll probably be cleared up. But I mean, he signed to the PFL. The PFL have said that he was going to debut in March of next year. But the amount of money that I think he would leave on the table by not just continuing in boxing it would be a lot of money. That said, I mean, if he does want to kind of thank the PFL for giving him this contract that allowed him to explore boxing and, and kind of do what he wants to do, you know, I think that's probably what he does because he is, you know, at the end of the day, Francis is a pretty honorable guy. And I think that 
him doing MMA in March, maybe one last fight in MMA, and then moving over to boxing kind of full-time to close out his career is certainly a possibility. I think the PFL is coming out as huge winners in, in all of this. We're talking about them right now. I think a lot of people are talking about them right now. I think a lot of people are searching his contract with the PFL and figuring out what it is. You would have to think that they want him in the cage at least once. So that's in March. He can go do that. But it is a contract that allows him to explore boxing possibilities. I just don't know how he looks at a cage again. I mean, there's really not much for him in the PFL. You would know better than me in, in this lane. It's like, yeah, I'm happy for him that he, he got this this bag and he was able to leave the UFC and he signed with PFL. But as far as I can see, it's like there isn't no a real match in the PFL to make a fight that could earn him, uh, you know, top dollar. Obviously, the fight is against John Jones in the UFC, which they can still make. I don't. What's stopping the UFC from making John Jones versus Francis Ngannou? Uh, it's, they're both on ESPN. Uh, they can do that. Yeah, I would be shocked if he fights more than one fight in the cage. But he's got to return to boxing. He's a hot commodity right now. There are three or four heavyweights lining up right now that would fight him, and they are the bigger the bigger names: Deontay Wilder, Anthony Joshua, and uh, Tyson Fury rematch. I'll throw Anthony, uh, excuse me, Andy Ruiz in there, even though he's not much of a player at heavyweight. But the big the big uh, the big boys: Joshua, Fury, and Wilder are all circling around, figuring out how they can get an Ngannou date. Yeah, I mean, I'd probably put Usyk in that mix too, right? Like, I think anybody who has the opportunity yeah, is probably going to want to do it. It's funny, we always kind of just forget about Usyk. Uh, we shouldn't forget about Usyk. Um, if he can upset Fury, obviously Usyk is in the mix for Ngannou as well. If that fight happens. <laughs> I mean, it's is definitely that, that going to say? It's definitely going to happen, Usyk versus Fury. It's just, um, I never bought that it was going to happen in December. I mean, that's a quick turnaround. We're talking about a guy in Fury that was fighting basically once a year. He says he had a 12-month, uh, excuse me, a 12-week camp for this Ngannou fight. Surely it didn't look like it. I found it very hard to believe that they were going to go right into another camp for for Usyk. And you know, Usyk's a damn good fighter. So I always kind of believed it was going to be February, March. I, I'm leaning towards March. It's still, uh, you know, the Rida season out in Saudi Arabia. I think goes until March. So as long as it happens before then, the dollars are still green. Are the Saudi dollars green? What color is the Saudi money? I would like to know. I've never been over there. You gonna head over there? Or what? What's up? I, I don't think so. I don't think they, that would be a very safe time for me to go. I just, 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 just say I'm not sure. It's, that would be a very safe time for me to go there. I know it's not a great time to head over there, and and I would, I would suspect the security was off the charts given the amount of legends and celebrities that were in the crowd that they wanted to show you over and over. I mean, there was that legendary Phil that we saw on ESPN for this this uh, pay per view. How many times are they gonna show Ronaldo? I was like, if they show Ronaldo one more time, I'm turning it off. Yeah, he's just sitting fr uh, front row with the uh, Mohammed bin Salman. Is that his name? MBS? I don't know his name. His Excellency. His Excellency. His Excellency. He was sitting next to His Excellency with Usyk behind and, him. And, and Joe Tessa would be like, and there's Ronaldo again. And, uh, and there's a countdown just added 10 minutes onto the clock for when the fight's going to happen. Yeah, I, I think MMA fans got a, uh, a glimpse of how frustrating boxing pay-per-views can be with these ridiculously long... Uh, fills in between the co-main event and the main event. These video rollouts. They're, we already bought the pay-per-view. We're, we're sold. You got us. Like There's no need to sell us on the fight anymore. I think I saw a lot of tweets from MMA fans like, is this what it's always like for big boxing pay-per-views? Yep, that's what it's like. We complain about the PFL that has like 15 minutes between fights. Like that's We're very a uh, very impatient breed. 15 minutes, perfect. You can go get a, something to eat and go to the bathroom, and then you settle back in for a fight. We're talking like an hour. They're not usually an hour in boxing, but I've seen like... 30 minutes, 45, because uh, they want to get it in at that, that, that uh, the perfect time, but it's silly. Well, I think it was Canelo Plant. Or, I don't remember who Canelo was against when it was the same night as the UFC event, and they, they had him just laying yeah. down on the couch in the back. Don't remember that, was the end. That, was. that was the end of Canelo working with um, Golden Boy and uh, not the zone. I think it was Canelo versus Kovalev, and it was going up against Masvidal Diaz, BMF, and yeah. uh, it's now a meme forever. <laughs> of Canelo laying on the couch with his gloves. So whenever there's a long break, I always pull that meme out and get some easy easy likes, Aaron. Yeah, some some good engagement there. Yeah, that was uh that was all of us uh, on Saturday except I had to call an event and I was like I, I was getting annoyed because Oh, I had a great one. I had, uh, Yeah, I hear you, man. I had a great one. I had uh, Bob Arum at the beginning of this pay-per-view and it was him uh, a young Bob Arum, a photo I found <laughs> on the internet. I like that. Well, Dan, thank you for doing this. Appreciate it. It's great to get a perspective from somebody who's so entrenched in the boxing world on uh, what exactly happened on Saturday and how the boxing world is reacting to it. I think you are a little bit more progressive than a lot of your uh, <laughs> colleagues and optimistic than a lot of your colleagues. So I, I do appreciate that angle as well. Thank you for doing this with me.
Thanks for coming on, man. I'm a big fan of yours from from afar. Uh, I think you do great work in the uh, MMA world, and I really appreciate you having me on.